Hello and welcome to this session uh, discussing restoring trust in science and technology. Um, even as COVID-19 has made science an everyday topic across the world, it's also revealed how much mistrust in science there is and technology breakthroughs and the media that report on them. Um, what are the driving forces of this mistrust and what needs to be done to restore public confidence. I'm Jeremy White, I'm executive editor at Wired UK, and I'm joined here by an extraordinary panel uh, that we'll be asking questions of throughout the session. Um, from my uh, far right here, we have uh, Shafi Goldwasser, co-founder and chief scientist at uh, Duality Tech, director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing at UC Berkeley. Uh, we've got Pauline Patterson, uh, co-director of the Vaccine Confidence Project, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and then Raja Chakawi, uh, professor of nuclear physics, Mohammed V University of Rabat, and member of Hassan Second Academy of Science and Technology. And finally, Denise here next to me, Denise Dresser, writer, political scientist, and professor, Department of Political Science, the Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico. Welcome, all of you. Thank you very much for joining us. First question we have is, what are the drivers of contemporary public mistrust in science and technology? And so, Pauline, if I may start with you, uh, what are the key public concerns around vaccination? How, how does trust or distrust play a particular role? Thank you. Yes, for vaccination programs to be successful, it really does depend on trust, confidence, um, not just in the vaccine. So is the vaccine safe? Is it effective? But also trust in their healthcare providers. So does, does your doctor have your best interest at heart? Is your doctor competent? Um, or the healthcare provider at giving you that vaccine, but also trust in the process, trust in the policy. So is the policy based on evidence um, do people have trust in, in the policies that are there? And, and that's really key. And, and what we found is we conducted a study at the Health Protection Research Unit in Immunisation, exploring parents' views of whether they would accept a vaccine or not. 90% said they would. So in the UK, for example, um, people are willing to be vaccinated when asked. But the reasons why they weren't so keen to get vaccinated was this concern around safety, concerns around effectiveness, or possibly not feeling at risk as well. So, so we don't just look at confidence, trust, but we also look at convenience. Is it somewhere that's easy to get to? Is it far away? Is it at a time that you, you can go get vaccinated? If you're working during the day, can you go in the evening, at the weekend? And also in terms of cost, but also complacency. So do you feel at risk of the disease? And, and we have seen that some people don't feel at risk of the disease because it does affect um, more vulnerable people, more elderly people. So, so the young, we've seen, are less likely to want to get vaccinated yeah. because they don't feel at risk. How do you go about not alienating people, you know, when in encouraging people to get the vaccination, the jabs, but without alienating them? You're talking about making it convenient. Mm. But how do you, the people that don't want to have them, for example? It's really important not to stigmatise those that aren't vaccinating. And it's really important to not say that they're not vaccinating because they're uneducated or they don't know, they don't know enough and we need to educate them. It's really important to figure out why are they not vaccinating? Is the vaccine in a place where people can go? Is it convenient? Figuring out, talking to them, not just communicating out, but also engaging with people, figuring that out, and then addressing those issues. It'd be interesting to see what, what has been the most successful efforts either of you have seen in fighting vaccine hesitancy. Before I answer that specific question, I want to address uh, some global trends that... Russia is simply one more evidence of. Right. It have to do with declining trust worldwide. And this is measured by the recent Edelman poll on trust. Decline in trust in governments, decline in trust in the media, decline in trust in uh, uh, journalists. And I think this is fueled by two uh, parallel phenomena. One has to do with the disillusionment with liberal democracy around the world yeah. because of inequality, because of the rise in poverty, because of failure to deliver. And you're seeing the rise of, of populists on the left and on the right that uh, because of the particular way in which they govern, tend to uh, 
provide a narrative whereby they have alternative facts, yeah. and people should trust in them as the embodiment of of, of the people, and therefore they tend to discredit data. And scientists are part of a data data driven group of society. So there's that that political factor, and uh, I, I think. It also has to do with a second trend, which is the rise of social media as a way uh, uh, of conveying disinformation about vaccines, as a way of spreading conspiracy theories. And because of the distrust in traditional institutions, people are now getting their information via Twitter, via Facebook, and the hesitancy rises so specifically from those sources of disinformation. Where are vaccines working well? Where is there more trust? In places where there's trust in government, where there's trust in science, where there's trust in institutions. Um, Raja, that actually leads me to ask you a question, really. You know, even leaving aside um, this polarisation here, but do, do policymakers, these, you know, the politicians... Uh, uh, trust science and research in your experience is this 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 seems to be key for whether we're actually mm. imparting trust from through to the general public if the if the if the if the, if the, if the, if the policy makers and the lawmakers are brought on board is this your experience with, in your field yes um i think trust is mandatory to build a, pro a scientific project and i can give uh, my example i am working in fundamental physics so uh, when, uh, in uh, 1996, uh, as the head of uh, nuclear physics laboratory, I proposed to my minister to, uh, that Morocco becomes a member of an international scientific collaboration. It's not easy for our country. So you have to give all arguments. You have to... To, uh, to give also what benefits you, uh, our country we have. And this is very, very important to, to have the confidence of our ministry. And when, uh, he, when we have his agreement, agreement, after that, I can give some example, for please, example. Please yes, uh, I, I show that first we will have a younger researcher, PhD student or post, in high-level scientific, it's very, very important for our country. We will have uh, technical transfer, technical transfer in our country. We will have innovative training. So all that is very important. And after that, the concrete results and positive results establish confidence until today. And despite the change of government, and this is very, very important. Speaking of widening out to other areas as well, Shafi, uh, I wanted to bring you in to talk about um, AI applications, something that's in the news a great deal uh, over the last few years. But we use more and more AI applications every day. Um, and this is area that you work in specifically. So do people trust or mistrust algorithms, or should they mistrust algorithms? Uh, yeah, so in fact, um, it's a very good question <laughs> because, uh, as we know, in the last five years or so, there's more and more talk about machine learning and AI methods uh, being used in every aspect of life. And some of it is, uh, are things we don't even think about twice. So the fact that we reroute traffic because we know where traffic is going. That has to do with the fact that we have a lot of data about traffic, and we have algor smart algorithms who tell us how to drive faster and safer. Similarly, about energy rerouting, and obviously everybody knows about medicine, that we have a lot more data about uh, illnesses, about causes from all over the world, and if we collaborate and bring this data together, we can also learn insights about better you know, ph pharmaceuticals and so forth. Um, so AI has been there, it's because we now have more data and more computing power, uh, we are able to actually take advantage of this data and using these AI techniques. And obviously that's a good thing. So it would be very unfortunate if because of mistrust, uh, these algorithms are not employed. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the mistrust, I think, not even touching on your earlier question, yeah. the other panelists, is because everything's happened so quickly. Yeah. You know, it's, even, with the, even with the 
vaccine. If you think about it, some of the things that the anti-vaxxers say make sense to all of us. It's, it's so fast, you know. This uh, uh, vaccine was developed so quickly and we're supposed to take it, and who knows? The point is that we have no time, and that's why we're doing it. So with AI, there's all these techniques. They've inc they're incredibly powerful, you know, language translation. The, the things we know that we're yeah. using this, there are things we can do today, the illnesses we can cure, because we have all this available and there's a, an amazing thirst to use it because it's so powerful. However, because it's quick, you know, regulation lags, uh, and not only regulation, even technologically, and this is things that I work on, uh, you do have to pay attention. Yeah. Is it accurate? How do you verify accuracy? Is it transparent? Why is a machine learning algorithm making one decision versus another, for example, in things like bail? Is it um, robust? So in other words, if you, is it, are there sort of outlier cases where this thing is brittle and it will break and it will affect people? Is it um, fair? You know, there's a lot of use of this term fairness. In other words, if you have a lot of data about um, about people, but you don't have a lot of data about minorities, and now you've changed the whole medical treatment, it might affect these minorities badly. So scientists, so it's more science, it's not less science. More science will fix these problems, in my opinion, because you pay attention to it, you make definitions, you come up with methods. But so I guess my point is, you should, it would be really too bad not to trust because we won't be able to take advantage of what we can. Uh, there are legitimate reasons why people are hesitant because of the speed of the science is moving. But in my opinion, the way to fight it is to have more science. And education, obviously, an explanation to people that it's not somebody is always trying to take advantage of them. Okay. Denise, let me bring you in here. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to broaden this discussion because uh, I think we're, we're headed very quickly to uh, a situation where you have incredible advances in technology, in AI, and then those raise all sorts of ethical issues Absolutely. and isu issues about how does science intersect with democracy? Yes. Because those tools that scientists are in, in your part of the world very excited about at UC Berkeley, um, I'm beginning to see, as a comparativist, uh, how those tools can be used by authoritarian governments and not for good purposes. I mean, you see the rise of AI for surveillance technology, uh, and I think science is, it, it should not be only for the few. It needs to integrate policymakers, and there needs to be a debate about the ethical implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, even now in COVID, for example, uh, what did we see? That Twitter, Facebook, uh, that were platforms for the dis dissemination of incredibly valuable information also became tools for the spread of disinformation. And only a year and nine months into the pandemic has Twitter started to move against those that were providing information uh, that led people to vaccine hesitancy. Mm. Only then were they, only now are they starting to remove accounts that were virulent spreaders of disinformation, Fox News being among them, for example. So I think there's a responsibility for corporations, for platforms, and for the scientific community to bring in the ethical dimension, and also for policymakers, because we see the weaponization of science, the weaponization of artificial intelligence. And I think those, those, that raises significant questions for the scientific community and for those of us who are in the defense and promotion of democracy worldwide. How do uh, we actually combat that then? If, you're talk if we're talking about this disconnect between the science itself and what it can actually do and then how it's implemented, those are two separate things. It's like almost trying to attribute whether fire is good or evil or not. Mm -hmm. And so you know, when we're talking in those terms, how do we actually go beyond the point of, of, of just saying AI is evil or AI is used for evil or just, you know, and, and, and being able to educate the public and mm -hmm. saying it's not science that's the, the problem, it's how it is used or who is, is using it that is the problem. How do we change those attitudes if, if the public perception is always bound up with how the science is actually used rather than what the science is? 
I think in terms of um, vaccines, if I can add, so we, we conducted a study looking at disinformation around vaccines and, and it, we did see that if someone is exposed to misinformation around COVID vaccine, they're more likely to decline vaccination. So, so there is that, but also, although people go to the internet and they go to social media, they don't necessarily trust it. So we, we can't blame social media for the reasons that people aren't vaccinating. And, and we, we also conducted sentiment analysis to look at what people are discussing around the COVID pandemic, for example. And most of it is neutral or, or positive towards public health. So, so the media do occasionally have headlines that make you worry and fear that most of the information online is, is not credible and, and worry that people are going to try and change your mind about things. But, but it's a real small minority, that disinformation. But also with the internet, with social media, people that can group that couldn't group before and you can find information that will pre um, reinforce your pre-existing views so if you're worried about something you'll find someone else who's worried about it and, and actually you can fall down that rabbit hole of, of, of getting into worry and fear but I think you're being very specific to the UK. If you look at examples around the world, uh, and I'm not even talking about developing countries, look at what's happening in the United States where uh, it's not only that people receive bad information from the media, they are receiving bad information from elected officials, from, from governors who uh, mm. are, are vaccine reluctant, who don't want <coughs> vaccine mandates, who keep insisting that these are not times, uh, 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 after more than a year of the pandemic, these are not times for, uh, for masks, obligatory masks in public schools, for example. I think that the issue of, of bad leadership, mm. not paying attention to science, mm. I think we have to take into account count what's happening in many other countries of the world. And if those countries aren't vaccinated, we're not going to be safe so worldwide, globally yeah. speaking. So we haven't just been doing studies in the UK, we've been doing global studies. And we did do a 19 country study where we looked at trust in information from government and those that trusted were more likely to vaccinate. Yeah. But I think it's really important that ev um, policies are based on evidence because people will be more likely to trust them. But, but I agree that... Um, these will be amplifying factors of distrust if your, if your government are making decisions that aren't based on science. Like, do you think we, it's, we, we really should be looking at, you know, this right. idea of politicians, you know, taking science and perverting it in some way? Do you think we should be going back to basics in a way, showing the public what is science so yes. they can make their own distinction? Uh, I think with, um, with the COVID pandemic, and the urgency to, to eradicate it. Everyone has forgotten that science needs time, mm. takes time. And this is very important. Indeed, the pro scientific process is well known uh, and uh, requires uh, several steps. Uh, first, of, uh, first of all, you, you give a hypothesis. You propose a model. And after that, you have to confirm this, this hypothesis by an experiment or an observation. And uh, finally, uh, the publication of the results and uh, review by peers. Mm -hmm. So uh, large publics and decision makers have has to be aware of the time need, needed to ensure the outcome of science. I think it's very, very important. And with this pandemic, all people have forgotten that. The late Stephen Hawking wrote shortly before his death that as a scientist at Cambridge University, he had lived in an, ex quote, an extraordinarily privileged bubble. Should scientists, therefore, really, I think, have more of a responsibility in addressing the concerns of real world outside of academia? Denise. No. Absolutely. I'm an academic, but at the same time, I feel that my responsibility is to make very complex issues and academic jargon intelligible to the broader world so that people understand what's at stake. And I think um, these panels are useful. They would be more useful if we actually had politicians on them.
because <laughs> no, no, they are the ones making the decisions. Yeah. I mean, you mm. are all incredible scientists, and I, I trust and value your work intrinsically. But there's a big gap between your world and the people who are making decisions on the basis of electoral political imperatives, mm. keeping their party in power, winning an election, and they use science or abuse science or ignore science for their, or for their own purposes. I think it's important for the scientific commun community to know how to communicate to the broader public, to integrate their work or discuss it with policymakers, to develop uh, the field of scientific journalism. For example, in the midst of the pandemic, the work that I found most useful was Ed Yong's incredible articles in The Atlantic explaining COVID to the broader world. He won a Pulitzer Prize for that. And I think in every country, you should really develop that field so that you can directly address the public and its concerns, oftentimes jumping over politicians who are distorting what you are doing and what you are saying. Should scientists enter the political arena to stop this happening. Denise? Uh, I want to take this opportunity to denounce something that is going on in my country and I think is uh, uh, something that is, is happening elsewhere, which is um, the, the political persecution of scientists. Mm. So I think in those specific circumstances, science has to defend itself and you need to forge a co an international community or coalition in defense of science and for people to speak up and say, this is wrong. We have to build relationships across communities, scientists, academics, policymakers, media, journalists, etc., uh, at a time when in some places, science is being applauded, and in others, it is being persecuted. About public trust in science, and does it matter, and what are the solutions that we can know? We've already touched on some of these solutions anyway. It's nice that this discussion is weaving between them all. But regarding media, which we've mentioned a couple of times here, and obviously I'm being a member of the media, it's interesting to me. Like, should we, um, I'm always interested in, should we dumb down science in order to make it more understandable, more accessible, and at what point does simplification of this communication um, vulgarize science too much or degrade it too much? Is, that, is there a trade-off somewhere? Would you rather more people understood? I saw that in France, that you have a master only on scientific mediation. And this is very important. And also, science is going very quickly. So international collaboration for each item is very important. We have to change, mm -hmm. to, to have a relation between, no, we haven't to, to, to talk about Africa, Europe, America. No, we have to talk, to talk about a project. And we call all the experts in the world and to explain after it, we have to have the project, but also to prepare us to communicates with decision maker. It is an exercise, it's not easy to communicate to the large public, and the large public is also this decision makers. It's very important. And I think you have to shift towards just better communication, broader communication, clearer communication, and resources, governmental resources mm -hmm. devoted to that communication. I agree, but just to say something, you, you were asking about do, should, should uh, journalists uh, vulgarize or whatever. I mean, it's the wrong term. But I actually, I think it's, uh, no, there is no low, there's nothing low enough. There's so no enough, low bar. No bar. So, in, no, I'm joking, but I, I, I mean, you know, the mad scientist and going back to the, come, going back to the future, wonderful character. It's good that there are these characters which are scientists and are sympathetic, which I guess the media can use, or um, cartoons of, of, of scientists. I, th I think the more the better, mm -hmm. because I think that scientists uh, being viewed as friendly characters, even for, ch for children who are going to grow up to be the adults who either respect scientists or don't respect scientists, and that they're not you know, s nerds or people who are, uh, cannot communicate or are not sympathetic. Uh, obviously, the media can have a big part in making scientists as, as characters, as a profession, more accessible, more desirable. 
I think actually media does a, a great job in uh, documentary films now about science. There's a lot more understanding about phenomena, about climate, and um, th that's, that's a big service that, that media does. What about, sorry, Pauline? Yeah, I'd love to add, um, at the, in the UK, we've got the UK Science Media Centre, and they say media will do the science better when science do the media better. So they bring together scientists and media, and, and it's, a, it's a great network, great collaboration, because then if, as journalists, you, you will know, you're in a rush, you need to write your piece, you've only got 24 hours, I don't know how long you have. Uh, but, um, and the Science Media Centre help kind of bring in the scientists and, and help us write press releases as well. And I think it works really well. And mm. I think it's really important so that media doesn't sensationalise or, or try and grab the attention by, by, by having incorrect facts as well. So, so I do often talk to journalists and it helps to clarify what is happening. And because sometimes people, even other scientists in other fields, don't understand what's happening, so they need to talk to someone who does. That's a very good point. Do you think the media should be more re ready to, to follow that example and not try and go for a, a binary answer? So it's a very interesting question you asked about the media, but that's your profession. So. Uh, being binary, you know, or be, um, uh, sensational, or get, or being decisive, so sounds like a good strategy, yeah. right? But it might not be the only strategy. So uh, provoking thought is another strategy. So I assume that it ap it appeals to me, and my my guess is that it appeals to a lot more people than media believes. So in other words, even about uh, something very technical, you know, that you have an algorithm that uh, makes recommendations, and you want to make it accountable. And then there's a question, are the algorithms today accountable? Can you, like a doctor, if he does a malpractice, you can sue him. Can you sue an algorithm? And maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. How do we make algorithms accountable? So by bringing up these, que these questions, but not as an accusation, algorithms are not accountable. Let's not use algorithms. No, no, that's not the end. It's an interesting question. How do you make an algorithm accountable? Can it be done? So with, if media was able to provoke thought, would be, wouldn't it be wonderful? Uh, I don't think it's an impossible task, but the easier task, of course, is to provoke sensationalism. Mm. I, and I want, I, I want to agree with you because um, I think media has also the responsibility of raising questions. Yeah. Food for thought. Right. You know, a, 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 at the intersection of science, technology, ethics. What are we going to do, for example, uh, about the ethics of artificial wombs that are going to be down the road in five years? Or um, who gets to go to, the, to Mars? Who gets to live on Mars? I mean, should it just be private corporations that establish colonies? Or is this the responsibility of governments and is some regulation required? Just to put out two questions there. But there are so many more. Right. Uh, and, I, and I think the media should be posing those questions as, as, as hypotheses, as exploratory issues, as food for thought. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to end this session. We've covered a lot of ground here today. So I want to leave you with some sort of takeaway from our distinguished panel, actually. So I think the best thing I can do is basically to um, ask you, if you had to choose one thing, what's at the top of your list uh, for restoring public confidence in science. We've covered many different factors, but if you can only choose one, and I'm going to keep you to one, um, and you can, you, know, you can agree with each other, I'm not asking you to choose different ones, but uh, Shafi, we'll start with you. So like one, just one, the, what's at the top of your list to, to, to fix? Um, I think the media. The media. Is, yeah, is to make the media be less about sensation and more about exploration. <laughs> Excellent. Pauline. Uh, I had five in my list, but if I was to choose one, I would go with engagement. Engagement with the public. Listen, don't assume, discuss, listen, engage. Really key. Wonderful. Raja? Uh, I think scientific media, mediation. Mediation. Uh, to cultivate dialogue between large publics, decision makers, and scientists. Wonderful. And lastly, Denise. Making science intelligible, making it uh, easily easy to understand, communicating better, and understanding that scientists do not work in isolation from politicians and from other members of society, and you d do need further integration and collaboration and communication. Wonderful. Thanks so much indeed. I'd like to thank uh, our distinguished panel here. I'd like to thank the audience as well. Thank you for joining us.
uh, in this session here on restoring trust in science and technology. Uh, enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thanks again.